Good afternoon. Every Sunday at 1.45 p.m., Carson Peary Scott & Company, one of America's great stores, presents a distinguished guest in Chicago. Today, our speaker is His Holiness Mar Eshai Shimun, both temporal and spiritual head of the Assyrian people, and one of the most important public leaders who is to speak to us on the subject, Significance of Middle East Events. Because the Middle East has become the new political powder keg of the world, his heritage and seasoned judgment provide a tremendous authority in appraising events there, as well as in judging the future of mankind. For more than 600 years, his family has guided the destinies of the Assyrians through a long series of attacks and persecutions from ambitious military powers, equaling in severity the biblical misfortunes of this age-old buffer state. Cradle of civilization, Assyria has for 5,000 years maintained an enviable culture and a philosophy which is today, more than ever, a dependable moral and political standard. Despite enormous losses during World War I and World War II, when the Assyrians fought valiantly with the Allies, half a million of these men without a country scattered from Iraq to America look hopefully toward the future. Mar Shimon, statesman and philosopher, has traveled widely throughout the Western world representing his people before the League of Nations at Geneva and other international gatherings in Europe, making several trips to the United States, and now again representing the Assyrians before the UNO. He has also written widely. We are indeed glad to introduce His Holiness, Mar Eshai Shimon. When the First World War's Allied victory was heralded, it also heralded the end of the 6th century old Turkish rule in the Middle East and the final collapse of the once gigantic Ottoman Empire. It was like the fall of another curtain on a stage and before an audience that had already witnessed many a passing show. It was now Britain that was to occupy the stage. The long oppressed non-Muslim elements in the Middle East believed that the day of salvation for which they had prayed and struggled for so long had dawned at last. However, to the utter amazement of all the non-Arab population in the Middle East, and indeed equally so to many an honest Englishman, four new Arab states were now created, namely Syria, Iraq, Transjordan and Hejaz. Time does not permit me to deal with the question in detail. I will therefore confine myself to Iraq and the events that have since taken place, and especially so as it relates to the question of the Assyrian Christians, which constitutes the greatest challenge I know to the principles of the Atlantic Charter and indeed Christianity itself. The present day Assyrians are the descendants of the ancient Assyrians, a people who gave the world the code of Hammurabi, a people to whose rich culture the world owed so much and whose religious conception, along with that of the Hebrews, is the forerunner of the Christian faith. With the advent of Christianity, the Assyrians were the first to adhere as a people to that faith. Speaking the Aramaic language, the language in which they received the gospel from the original sources, the Assyrians had a unique opportunity in appreciating the teaching of the Master and likewise conveying it, conveying it to non-Aramaic speaking peoples in a manner that was not possible to other races. Within the Persian Empire, they had grown to such an importance that they were recognized as a millet or nation, and the patriarch was recognized by the Persian emperors, the Arab caliphs, the Mughal khans, and the Ottoman sultans as both a spiritual and temporal head of the Christian within, Christians within the empire. In the field of the sciences and learning, the progress made by this church was equally remarkable. In the 8th century, Mar Iyu, Bishop Joe, principal of the University of Nizibi, wrote his famous book, on the elemental origin of the body, which in short means the atom. These and other sciences were introduced into Europe some five centuries later via Cordova, Spain, by the invading Moors. However, successive persecutions, first from the heathen and then from the Mohammedans, brought this progress to a complete stagnation and reduced this, this major branch of Christianity to almost a shadow of its former glory. Thus, during the First World War, the Assyrian Christians were living in what is now known as Hakkari Kurdistan, the mountainous part of the ancient Assyria, round Lake Urumia in Azerbaijan, and on the foothills of Mesopotamia. 
Having been promised their independence, they threw in their lot with the Allied force. Ill-equipped and ill-supplied, they fought gallantly against regular Turkish armies in swarm of Mohammedans, Kurds and Arabs. Between 1914 and 1918, they had made contact with the British troops in Mesopotamia. They had lost about 50% of their numbers through actual fighting, massacres and disease. The British government, who had encouraged resistance by the Assyrian nation against the Turks, had recognized the great contribution made by the Assyrians to the Allied cause in general and that of the British in particular. To quote only a few of the prominent Britishers who have witnessed to this fact, Colonel J.J. McCarthy, who headed the British military mission to Persia during the First World War, writing to me stated, I have made a strong point of the fact that your people were definitely promised by me, acting under orders from headquarters, of course, that they would have their country restored to them, and that my orders and only reason for raising the Assyrian contingent in Hamadan in 1918 was to drive the Turks out and, and reoccupy the country. I do hope the Foreign Office will do something and do it now and before it is too late. J.S. Ward of the London Daily Telegram stated, It was we who invited the Assyrians to rise against the Turks and promised them their independence and our protection if they would do so. In 1932, some 18 years prior to the date fixed by the League of Nations, much to the apprehension of the non-Arab elements in, the, in general, and the Assyrians in particular, Great Britain decided to terminate the mandate. The mandate's commission of the League of Nations was equally apprehensive, and it was after the British government had given specific undertaking, shouldering the moral responsibility, that the commission finally acquiesced to the demand. Thus the Assyrians were left refugees and unsettled and at the mercy of a people against whom they had previously been used. Alas, these fears were, were more than justified, for less than a year after Iraq was given its independence, one of the most savage massacres in history was conducted by the Iraqi army in uniform against unarmed Assyrians, men, women and children alike. The perpetrators of this slaughter were acclaimed as heroes by the Iraqi government and the Arab populace. They were decorated and raised to the ranks of generals and pashas. No attempt was made to bring one of them to justice. A British officer who visited the scene of this slaughter declared, I saw and heard many a terrible thing in the Great War, but what I saw in Semel is beyond human imagination. Likewise, declares Sir Henry Dobbs, State High Commissioner for Iraq, we have seemed to, by the abandonment of the Assyrians, to sacrifice our very honor. We have suffered the imputation that on the scene of their agony, we living have betrayed the hopes of our dead. Immediately following the massacre, I was denationalized and deported from Iraq without any trial and my demand for one has been refused all along. I pleaded the Assyrian cause before the League of Nations and the British Foreign Office. The League, however, was unable to find a solution to the problem. Thus the Assyrians were left in a far worse position even than that which existed prior to the massacre. Some 12,000 of the victims of the massacre in Iraq, composed for the large part of orphans and widows, were removed from Iraq and dumped in the most God-forsaken part of Jazeera in northeast Syria. Disease from one side and murders by the Bedouin Arabs from the other have already claimed a heavy toll from among their ranks. When the Second World War broke out, Great Britain finding itself friendless in the Middle East once again realized the usefulness of the Assyrians. At the time Britain was fighting unaided with its back to the wall, she was in a desperate plight. Rommel was poised at the gates of Alexandria, Syria and Iraq had fallen to the hands of the Germans and the precious Iraqi oil on which depended the Mediterranean fleet was in the hands of the enemy. On May 2nd, 1941, the British in Habanea, which is, which is the most important air base in the Middle East, found themselves completely surrounded by this splendidly equipped and well-mechanized Iraqi army, comprising of 40,000 strong, assisted by the German Air Force. The British had no troops at the time in Iraq except the Assyrian levies, and the majority of these were deployed to Egypt and the island of Cyprus. For the rest of the account, let me quote a few uh, uh, statements made by prominent Englishmen. Philip Guadella was commissioned by the British Air Minister to write on air power in the Middle East, stating, They had saved Iraq and the whole position in the Middle East. Indeed, they had saved something more. For three weeks later, the Germans went to war with Russia, and they had saved the road through Persia, which was now vital for the transit of Allied aid to the USSR. If that was to be safeguarded, Iraq must be in sure hands. And by strange conjunction of events, Habania had helped to save the Kremlin. Major Hamilton, writing in the Royal Central Asian Journal, referring to the Assyrian stand in Habania, stated, 
their loyalty and gallantry in Habania may well someday be claimed as their greatest contribution to mankind. The present Archbishop of Canterbury stated, stated when the Nazis had seized Syria and the Arabs of the Golden Horde were advancing from Baghdad to join hands with them, it was the Assyrians who, with the Royal Air Force, held Habania on the desert route and so stopped them from marching to the Persian Gulf Sea and saving India and Egypt changed the issue of the war. Since the war ended, the Assyrian troops have been reduced to the minimum by the British. But at the same time, they are being conscripted into the Iraqi army. This fact is of great, of great significance as a pointer to the future events in the Middle East, for hitherto the Iraqi government shunned recruitment of Assyrians. The fact is now that the events that have recently taken place in Azerbaijan have set the Kurds in Iraq restless. Thousands of them have already joined the forces of the influential Kurd, Sheikh Mahmoud of Barzan, who deserted Iraq and joined the Azerbaijan Russian-sponsored republic. The Iraqi Arab army, has, as already been shown, is not, is not much as a fighting force, and for mountain warfare it is worse than useless. They know there is only one element in Iraq of which the excellent Kurdish fighter is unwilling to come to grip, and that is the Assyrian. Secondly, except for religion, the Assyrian and the Kurd rationally have much in common, and both are anxious to live together amicably. Therefore, from the Iraqi government's point of view, and of which the British are not unaware, it is now the time to pit the Assyrians and the Kurds against each other, no doubt with the most appalling results, especially for the Assyrians. The Russians, on the other hand, who are unquestionably and naturally equally interested in the Iraqi oil and its strategic importance, are as the key to the Middle East, are not unaware of these facts. These prob the problems of the Middle East are therefore not ideological. Both communism and democracy are equally non-existent. Nor is it the racial problem between the Jew, the Arab, the Kurd, and the half a million Assyrians, thousands of whom now live happily as the citizens of the United States of America, many of these in Chicago, but it's one of our politics. It's the old game of divide and rule. These peoples have lived to together since the dawn of history. Each has respected the aspirations and the historical rights of the other, and if left to themselves, they could work out their problems. Therefore, the solution to this explosive political situation in the Middle East lies in the realization and fulfillment of the natural aspirations of the various elements referred to and the formation of a united republics of the Middle East, similar to that which has, has already been worked out in the case of Syria and Lebanon. There is more than plenty of room for all of them, and they could each make their definite contributions to the common cause, thus disposing with a problem that may result in the most far-reaching international consequences. This indeed, in a world where the advent of the aeroplane, the rocket, and finally the atom have nullified time and space, would be the height of folly to bring about because of a blind policy of national greed. God has given the United States of America a position and prestige which no other nation has enjoyed in history. May it use it wisely and effectively for the good of all mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to His Holiness Mareshai Shimon, temporal and spiritual head of the Assyrian people, speaking to you this afternoon on the subject, Significance of Middle East Events.